We start with our top story. President Paul Kagame said Monday Rwanda can no longer offer refuge to people fleeing violence in the Democratic Republic of Congo. But a day later, government spokesperson Yolanda Makolo said Rwanda had no intention to expel or ban refugees. She accused the media of misrepresenting Kagame's remarks. The crisis group, Richard Monserif, the interim director for the Africa Great Lakes, says, as far as Kinshasa is concerned, it views the Rwanda discourse as a ploy, among other things, to cover up Rwanda's reported collaboration with the rebel M23 group. Well, first of all, and at the heart of uh, the situation is the M23 insurgent movement, which has uh, expanded its operations in North Kivu province, has fought with the National Army, fought with non-state armed actors in North Kivu, has up until recently expanded around the north of Goma, which is the large city uh, capital of North Kivu, right on the Rwandan border. Now, the uh, authorities in the Democratic Republic of Congo accuse Rwanda of supporting the M23, and the Rwandans deny this. So that's the heart of the top-level political dispute that's been roiling in the Great Lakes for around about a year, uh, let's say since the end of 2021, when the M23 started to expand its activity. So how does this fit into the refugee situation? Sure. Well, the, the link is that the M23 were uh, operating in North Kivu and indeed um, took over Goma uh, in 2012 and in 2013 were persuaded to withdraw um, under military pressure and diplomatic persuasion. And they withdrew into both Uganda and Rwanda. And Rwanda took the M23 in and housed them in camps entirely transparently uh, under an internationally sponsored agreement. There was nothing um, untoward about that by any means. Um, And uh, Rwanda has uh, absorbed the uh, refugees from DR Congo, just as the Democratic Republic of Congo has absorbed Rwandan refugees, of course, since the um, terrible uh, genocide of 1994. So there's been refugee movements in both directions. Now, the M23 in the uh, Rwandan telling are Congolese and are refugees and, and this is where it starts to get controversial, uh, according to the Rwandans, are being blocked from returning to the Congo and claiming their full rights as Congolese citizens. Now, the Congolese deny this. The Congolese claim that any Congolese citizen is welcome back. And uh, the Congolese suspect that the Rwandan discourse about refugees is actually a distraction and a cover to try to put pressure back on Congo and, of course, also put pressure back on humanitarian organizations who deal with refugees and provide some kind of cover or perhaps distraction from Rwanda's uh, reported uh, collaboration with the M23. So in the middle, refugees are suffering. So what is the solution overall to the problem? Well, I think the first solution is to try to bring more stability to North Kivu province in particular, and more broadly, the east of the DRC, because that will allow the conditions for refugees to return and to rebuild their lives in their own uh, countries. I think also the top level diplomacy and the relationships between the heads of state needs to be uh, calmed down, if not entirely sorted out, which is fairly ambitious. Um, so that refugees don't get caught up in uh, high-level politicking and, you know, as you say, are suffering greatly in this situation. Uh, Just to underline, uh, obviously, President Kagame recently was talking about uh, refugees from the DR Congo in Rwanda, but we have a bigger and broader displacement crisis in the Great Lakes, including refugees, but also internally displaced people who are fleeing violence. Just in the last couple of months, indeed, mainly in November, um, the UN has counted 180,000 newly displaced people in North Kivu, and that's uh, in large part due 
to the expansion of the activities of the M23 and then, of course, fighting with the, uh, with the National Army and with other armed groups. So that's a, a, a huge number of people whose lives have been ripped up. And many of them, of course, are re-displaced. They've been uh, already displaced by violence living in refugee camps, and they're then turfed out of refugee camps to go and try and find a home somewhere else. Uh, so it's certainly a terrible experience for them. The DRC, along with the United States, several European countries, they have repeatedly accused Rwanda of backing the Tutsi-led rebels from M23. Although Kigali keeps denying the charges, uh, will these uh, denials hold up? It's not so much that Rwanda becomes more transparent about what it's doing in North Kivu. I find that very unlikely. I think what we need to hope is that top-level top level diplomatic pressure uh, can have some impact on uh, Kigali's support for this insurgent group. That was Richard Monsrief, the crisis group's interim director for the Africa Great Lakes. He talked with me from Lille in France. Officials from the U.S., France, and the United Kingdom criticized the use of Russian mercenaries in Africa at a briefing of the U.N. Security Council on West Africa and the Sahel on Monday. U.S. Deputy Ambassador to the U.N. Richard Mills accused mercenaries of Russia's Wagner Group of robbing countries of their resources, committing human rights abuses, and endangering the safety of U.N. peacekeepers and staff. France's political counselor, Isis Jaroud Darnot, said the model used by Wagner to help fight Islamic extremists in West Africa is totally ineffective and that its violations include the alleged killing of over 30 civilians in Mali. Britain's deputy UN ambassador, James Karuki, said the mercenaries have contributed to instability in Mali, Burkina Faso, Nigeria, and the Lake Chad Basin. In response, Russia's deputy UN ambassador, Anna Ivestiganiva, accused Western countries of looting and pillaging throughout the world and in Africa, including Libya. She said African leaders should resolve their own problems and decide who they want to cooperate with. Sudan's civil forces, who signed the Framework Agreement for a Return to Democracy, announced the start of the final phase of the political process with the participation of the European Union, the Troika of the United States, Britain and Norway, and ambassadors of Arab and Western countries. The president of the Sovereignty Council in Sudan, Abdel Fattah al-Burhan, and his deputy, Mohammed Hamdit, renewed the pledge to withdraw the army from politics and hand over the leadership of the next phase to civilians. VOA senior analyst Mohammed al-Shanawi discussed the potential of the agreement with Joseph Siegel, director of research at Africa Center for Strategic Studies. There are competing narratives about what's going on. On the one hand, there are indeed substantive negotiations between the military and civilian leaders on moving forward with a transition process, a transition process that would entail a democratic civilian-led government. And you know, as part of this discussion, uh, the military has agreed that it would be subordinate to a civilian leader during the transition process and that there would need to be reforms in the military, that the military would be integrated into a single unified command and would serve as a professional military, that there would be justice for abuses that the regime has committed since 1989, uh, the military would have to give up its private businesses, and, and that there would be a new constitution-making process. So there have been some substantive very explicit reforms that have been put on the table and and that are being openly discussed. And so that's a very encouraging development in Sudan. At the same time, there's another narrative that the military is simply playing along in this discussion, and it builds on the military's reputation for repeatedly balking at supporting a genuine transition in Sudan. And repeatedly, we have seen the military put forward proposals of a civilian-led technocratic government, but this government would, in fact, 
be uh, beholden to the military. So there are valid reasons for skepticism. Nonetheless, the fact that we're seeing this substantive dialogue between military and civilian leaders is a positive sign. For her part, the representative of the civilian forces that signed the framework agreement said that the agreement distances the military institution from politics and emphasizes justice. And she called on the rest of the civilian components to join the political process. Would the other civilian components join this process? Many of the main civilian organizations have already joined the process, and most of the others that haven't are at least participating in these discussions. And so the call to expand the other participants is an effort to broaden the coalition of civilian participation so that any ultimate agreement will be widely supported and will be robust through the transition process. Now, there are several armed opposition groups who have previously made deals with the military and they have declined to support the framework agreement. There are efforts to continue to engage them and to see if they can come along to the process as well. But overall, there is a you know, substantial level of support and engagement by the various civilian actors in Sudan. You know, all of this is tempered by a you know, healthy dose of, dose of skepticism about the commitment of the military to follow through with the transition. But, but they are engaging in, in the dialogue. That was Joseph Siegel, Director of Research at Africa Center for Strategic Studies. He was speaking with VOA's Mohamed Al-Shinawi. U.S. flights are slowly resuming departures after a computer system outage at the Federal Aviation Administration forced it to halt all flights departing in the U.S. early this morning. Julie Walker with the Associated Press has more. The FAA is lifting a ground stop on flights across the U.S. following a computer outage that resulted in thousands of delays and hundreds of cancellations quickly cascading through the system at airports nationwide. The FAA ordered all departing flights grounded early this morning but lifted that order just before 9 a.m. However, delays and cancellations continue to snowball. More than 4,300 flights were delayed and more than 780 canceled. While the White House initially said that there is no evidence of a cyber attack, President Biden said we don't know and called for an investigation. The FAA said its notice to air missions system went down and had to be restored. Julie Walker, New York. Yesterday says health workers can strike no more than three days because they are considered an essential service. Government spokesman Nick Mangwana tweeted that health professionals should continue providing emergency services during a strike. The Associated Press says other countries, including neighboring South Africa and Zambia, limit strikes by health workers but impose less severe punishments, such as dismissals, work suspensions, or docking salaries. Frequent strikes by health workers have for years strained Zimbabwe's public health facilities, which are already in a poor condition due to dilapidated infrastructure and medicine shortages. Public health workers say their low salaries and lack of basic equipment makes their jobs untenable. Fishers in Cameroon are urging authorities to crack down on hundreds of illegal fishers and fish farmers operating in the Gulf of Guinea after the EU banned imports of Cameroon's seafood. The EU announced the ban last week, saying Cameroon was not cooperating in the fight against illegal and unregulated fishing and fish farming. Moki Edwin Kindeka reports from Ad Inau, a fishing village on Cameroon's western border with Nigeria. Fishing boats arrive back at Irinao, a coastal village near Cameroon's western border with Nigeria. Authorities say there are several hundred fishers in Irinao, and most of their catch is exported to neighboring states like Nigeria as well as to Europe. But fishing authorities say many of the fishers operating in Cameroon's waters in the Gulf of Guinea are not registered and not from Cameroon. 
45 year old Beninese fisher Thomas Wazy says he left his town of Jugu in 2017 to fish in Cameroon's southwest region where it now is located. Wesi says his company has seven medium-sized vessels for semi-industrial fish farming. He says besides Cameroonians, Togolese, Beninese, Ghanaians and Nigerians, the Chinese are very much involved in either semi-industrial or industrial fish farming in Cameroon's part of the Atlantic Ocean. Wesi says boats prefer fishing in Cameroon's waters because neighboring Equatorial Guinea, Gabon and Nigeria have firm military controls to stop illegal fishing. The EU on January 5 banned Cameroon caught seafood, citing a zero-tolerance policy for illegal, unregulated and unreported fishing that threatens ocean resources. Cameroon's Fish Farmers Associations met Wednesday in the capital, Yaoundé, to discuss the issue. Member of the association, Kulu Bulu Pierre, says most illegal fishers in Cameroon's waters are from Africa and China. He says the illegal fishers operate through corrupt government officials and ignore prohibited fishing zones. C'est un problème de manque de responsabilité au sein de certaines administrations. Pierre says there is a lack of political will to stop high waves of corruption that are responsible for the proliferation of illegal fishing firms all over Cameroon. He says if the government does not take measures for the EU ban to be lifted, Cameroon's economy will be severely hurt as much of the 8,000 tons of shrimp and prawns for export will not get to European markets. Last year, the EU said it found many shortcomings in Cameroon's fishing industry, including allowing foreign boats that fish illegally to fly Cameroon's flag. The EU Commission says it will lift the ban against Cameroon if the country improves its fisheries governance and meets international obligations in fighting illegal and unregulated fishing. And Jan Gob Bitomo is coordinator of Agropol, a Cameroon government project to promote agro-industrial products including fish. Speaking to Cameroon's state broadcaster CRTV Wednesday, he said quick action is needed or else the EU ban will disrupt plans to export 200,000 tons of fish this year. La réglementation internationale veut que on ne puise pas dans les réserves. He says Cameroon should clear its South Atlantic and Gulf of Guinea maritime zones of hundreds of illegal African and Chinese fish firms that refuse to respect international regulations aimed at ensuring sustainability. Bitomo says by stopping illegal fishing, the Cameroon government will be ensuring that the present generation does not deprive future generations of their right to natural resources through overfishing and catching immature fish. Cameroon's Ministry of Livestock, Fisheries and Animal Industries did not respond to VOA's request for comments on the EU ban and allegations of corruption. China has repeatedly denied any wrongdoing and says it has tightened oversight of deep sea fishing boats. Moki Edwin Kinzaka for VOA News, Idinao, Cameroon. Authorities in Malawi have suspended primary and secondary schools in two big cities following a cholera outbreak that has killed more than 700 people. Steve Kamti Maleka, Save the Children Humanitarian Operation Leads in Malawi, tells VOA's Carol Van Dam that nearly half of the fatalities are children. As of yesterday, we had 21,552 confirmed cases of cholera, and out of this, unfortunately, uh, we have lost about 716 uh, people. And the, what we have seen in terms of percentage out of the affected confirmed uh, cases of cholera, about 40% of that are children who have also been um, um, affected by cholera. Over 700. When did this start? When did this cholera outbreak start? 
Uh, this out, the outbreak uh, started around uh, March. That's when the first uh, uh, case of cholera was confirmed. And uh, it has been there since then. Of course, what we noted was uh, at the very beginning, there were only a few districts. Uh, the country has about eight, uh, 28 districts. And at uh, that time, we had about two districts that were hotspots for cholera, especially in the, in the lower uh, Shire of, of Malawi, which is in the southern part of the country. So with time, we have seen cholera uh, spreading to other uh, districts, which normally would not consider them as traditional uh, cholera districts per se. So we have been seeing uh, uh, cholera cases increasing. Up until now, it has affected almost the whole country. And how many have died since just the beginning of this year? Since the beginning of this year, I may not have the accurate statistics per se, but we have seen increasing numbers, I think, in late uh, December and the early this year, where we have had districts maybe registering uh, cases over uh, 100 cases in a day. That's a lot. And maybe just to indicate that in Malawi, uh, uh, when things are normal per se, we expect cholera in the rain season, which usually runs between November and the, uh, April thereabout. Uh, that's when we normally expect cholera uh, issues. But uh, last year and this year has been quite unique that we have had cholera even uh, during the dry season, which uh, we don't expect uh, cholera. So we have had cholera more or less like throughout the whole year now, almost. So why is that happening? Why is it happening even in the dry season in Malawi? We believe, though at the moment we don't have uh, a particular research that has happened to determine that, but we can still attribute that to maybe issues of climate change, uh, where uh, maybe is to issues of water scarcity as a result of uh, uh, dryness, and the, we have seen a lot of uh, trees being cut down which affects our rainfall pattern. So we believe that this could also be attributed to climate change. Thank you for choosing.